We're sitting on the world's most famous racing circuit, broken down, and the alarm is now going off. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Fast and the Curious. I'm Betty Glover, still in Australia, and if you're a super observant listener and viewer, you will have noticed that I, of course, wasn't at Silverstone, which I was incredibly gutted about, which is why we are doing a full debrief to basically pick the brains of someone who was very much there in all of his glory, living his best life on the stage, Christian Hugill. Hello. Hi, Betty Glover. It's so lovely to talk to you again and have you back. Oh, have you missed me? Genuinely, yes. I, I, and I've said this to you on text <laughs> a number of times. I have missed you. I've missed talking to you regularly. I've missed seeing you regularly. We missed you at Silverstone, but we, of course, with your cardboard cutout. Now, now, actually, we should talk about this straight away. When you saw the cardboard cutout that we'd arranged, what was your reaction, please? I was just like, what on earth is that? Because you didn't tell me about it. And I just saw on Insta a picture of you and Greg on a stage. And then I just, like, looked and I was like, what, what is that? And then just saw this, like, massive cardboard cutout of myself. And I was like... How on earth that got there? Why is that there? What is that? Shall I go and get her? She's here, actually. Hang on, stay there. So whilst Christian goes to get that bloody cardboard cut out, uh, we've got plenty that we're going to talk through. We're going to talk through some of the highlights of the weekend, on and off the track, of course, including an incredible story from Greg, which we didn't have time to put in the episodes over the weekend, but it is very funny. And a brilliant interview with a Fast and Curious debut for McLaren's F1 Academy driver, Bianca Bustamante, which we recorded at Silverstone. And there he is, Christian's back with my cardboard cutout. That is just it's really freaky. Here we are. Um, well, this is quite a moment for the Fast and the Curious. Cardboard Betty, meet real Betty. Hello. Hello, Cardboard Betty. Lovely. All right, darling, delighted to sit in for you over the weekend, Betty. How is Australia? <laughs> what are you going to do with that? Are you just going to keep it in your flat forever? <laughs> I'm keeping it, yeah. Because right. I keep getting messages from your flatmate, Chris, who just keeps sending me pictures of my cardboard cutout in different areas. Yeah, you've, of... Ever since I got back from Silverstone, you've been in a different place every day. <sighs> Great. Well, you just put me there then. Lovely. Just put you there. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. <laughs> How are you feeling though? Have you have you emotionally recovered? Because it was such a roller coaster for you, wasn't it? Have you slept for like four days straight? So I got home Monday afternoon, and oh, you've just fallen down. <laughs> Betty's just fallen down behind me. I'll move Betty out of the way now. Oh. Jesus, it's just broken in half. She had a lot more worse treatments over the weekend, I can assure you. Uh, she was bunged in the back of a suitcase. Anyway, um, yeah, no, I had until... So I got back on Monday. I did a lot of sleeping on Tuesday, as I know producer Jimmy did. I had a long lie in. But I'm, I, I, I've been being asked all week, how's the come down from Silverstone? And there just hasn't been one. I think I'm just still really happy from it. That hey, and, and listen, obviously... I'm there to enjoy it, but it's also work for me now. So obviously you're, you're also there, I'm glad that everything went okay. Yeah, so it's a bit stressful at the same time, isn't it? But also just like how privileged we were to watch such a thing happen. Oh. Oh, I've not come down from the high of it. It was just the best weekend. Do you know what? Every, everyone in Australia that I've come across has been talking about it as well. It's just been such a massive story for the sport. It's just like all these little things just came together for Hamilton. It was like the perfect story, wasn't it? Perfect fairy tale story for him. Like Lars Silverstone at Mercedes, who have backed him for however many years, who have supported him since he was really young. And then you've got like he hasn't won a race for two years or whatever it is and it's just like this perfect thing and you were there crying your eyes out as you witnessed it happening i, I didn't mean by the way the, i had one or two people on uh, social media saying well i couldn't force tears there was no forcing of tears there that i've never cried at formula one in well since I've, i'm 32 i've been watching it since i was what eight i've never cried once and by the way if you, if you missed this this is on YouTube, you can watch me and Greg sort of goggle box style watching the race. Uh, and it was in the last pod as well. And I bawled my eyes out when Hamilton crossed the line. And I've never done that in F1 before. You know, you Betty, you know how much I love this sport. But I've never cried at it. And it was just, mm. it was the emotion of, 
I'd start, my, my heart had sort of said Hamilton will fight for wins again. But when you put your cold, hard, logical sports broadcaster head on and you think, well, there's no guarantee Mercedes or Ferrari will give him a car that can win because, let's be honest, neither of them have shown consistently that they can in the last couple of years. And with his form not being as good as it was last year, this year, with Russell winning in Canada, with Russell taking pole, he just sort of started to just think, are we going to see it again? Have we, have we, without realising it, got to the end of the Hamilton era? And there was that moment, Betty, it was lap, was it 18? Yes, 18. The moment I just thought, oh, this is on, was when he passed Russell. When the, when the rain started to come down, lap 18, and he passed Russell. That was the defining moment for me where it was like, oh, my God, we've got vintage Lewis Hamilton here. Mastering wet conditions overtaking his teammates, sort of reasserting his dominance on not just that Mercedes team, but also the sport, a bit of a, hello, everybody. This is what I can do. Don't forget about me. It was like, okay, Lewis could do this. This is, we've got, we've got vintage A-game Lewis Hamilton on here. So it was just, it was amazing. I'm also buzzing for all of the Mercedes fans who probably for ages, well, two years they've been struggling, have just been like suffering, thinking, are, are we ever going to see Hamilton win in in a Mercedes car again? And it happens at Silverstone, just incredible. But my big question for you is, right, after two years of struggling, the car wasn't competitive. They didn't know how to make it competitive. It just wasn't working. We've talked about it loads on this podcast. How have they managed to get it to this point? Like, why has it just suddenly clicked for them? The big problem's been understanding the, the rule changes. Since the rule changes came in in 2022, Mercedes have had a car that when they go, OK, we think this will make it better, whatever that may be, it just hasn't worked. And that's a really concerning situation for a team to be in because it sort of demonstrates a sort of lack of understanding of, of the particular rule set. Whereas Red Bull have gone, this will make it better, and it has. But there was also talk differently than I noticed in the Silverstone Paddock to Canada. There were people going, no, I think Mercedes can win this on sheer pace, even if the track's dry. And in the early parts of the race, I expected Verstappen and or Norris to sweep past the Mercedes drivers. And they just didn't. You had Norris starting in third, Verstappen starting in fourth. And even in the early stages, you were like, oh, they're in this, aren't they? Mercedes are genuinely in this. So they've finally started to understand the car and taken a step forward. And, and two wins speak for themselves. It's the first time they've had two wins in a season since 2021. So, yes, uh, they are finally making a proper step forward. Yeah, and Toto Wolf said five races ago they weren't contenders for the podium at all, which is just crazy when you think about how far they've come. But I was reading somewhere and they were saying that m the Mercedes car now is really good when it comes to, like, high-speed corners. And obviously Silverstone's full of high-speed corners. So are we expecting... Mercedes, are they properly back now or are they going to struggle again at different races? The only note of caution I sound for Mercedes fans is Ferrari because, yes, they look better in slower speed corners, hence they were good in Monaco and Leclerc won, but they've sort of had such a spectacular collapse. Yes, Carlos got fifth in Silverstone, but, you know, that's... that's fifth. Who, who cares? Do you know what I mean? Before I'm properly sort of, you know, what's that analogy where you're stamp the flag, stamp the pole stick thing down. I've not said this very well. I'm still quite tired. Being... Put the put the stick in the hole? Or... Yeah, that, something like that. Before <laughs> I probably, you know, go, right, yeah, Mercedes are back. I just want to see another couple more Grand Prix <laughs> where they are right back up there. And Betty, I think you're now laughing at stick in the hole, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Centre. She just made herself laugh. Oh, God. You know, nail your, there's an analogy there. Nail your flag to the pole. There's an analogy there. <laughs> we knew what we went, obviously. Um, what a lot of people are asking is, and I want to know what your take is on this, actually, but a lot of people are saying, do you reckon Hamilton will be regretting his move to Ferrari now, seeing as Mercedes have increased their competitiveness and Ferrari, as we just said, have fallen off a cliff? I'm assuming he's not. The, well, he, he was asked in the press, in the FIA press conference, he was asked this and he gave, so, he was, it was sort of a really classy response where he was, you know, when you see people get grumpy with reporters in press conferences, he didn't do that, but he really, with a real smile and warmth, just went, uh, you know, are, are you regretting the move? 
No. He's leaving on a high, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, also, this was a handful of races ago where Mercedes are really struggling and Ferrari have got their, you know, best foot forward. And we're all going, well, Lewis is going to be grateful to get out of Mercedes. Things change so quickly. We've got another half season of development. We've got the winter before Lewis even turns a wheel for the first time at pre-season testing in a Ferrari. Yeah, and I was thinking as well, he'd much rather leave Mercedes, his final season at Mercedes, having, you know, got some wins and, you know, he's leaving on a high rather than leaving yeah. when, you know, it's all a bit depressing, they haven't been competitive. And he's like, OK, bye everybody. Yeah, yeah. And you saw, of course it stung when he left and it will have stung Toto Wolf, but you saw the warmth still there. Yeah. I've heard a few people say, oh, well, yeah, McLaren should have won the race. Well, if they'd have nailed it, they might well have done. But Mercedes did nail it. You know, him and Bono working together, his race engineer, they called the track conditions perfectly. They knew when to pit. Lewis knew when to push and heat up the tyres and go for the move on George and when to hang back a little bit and not get caught up in, in the drama and people running wide. It was just a perfectly executed race. You mentioned McLaren. Let's talk about them because, like, what, what is going wrong? So if you look at it, right, they could have won Canada, Spain, Austria and Silverstone, but they haven't because they're making small mistakes. Where are they going wrong? What's going wrong? Why is it not working? It is, it is working. It is working. They've made huge steps forward over the last 18 months. They're picking up regular podiums. It's going well. To me, they look like a team not used to finding that final 5-10% you needed to convert these good results, these podiums into race wins. And that's not a criticism of McLaren. That's statistical facts. They're not used to that. They have not had a car capable of regular wins for a long time. And they will know in Formula One that these wins is why I was heaping praise on Red Bull and Max so much last year about the sheer levels of perfection. And I mentioned last year so many times when there were opportunities to make mistakes, they didn't. And we're now seeing from McLaren that truly to win a Grand Prix, you need perfection. Mm. And this isn't a criticism of anyone in that team. What I'm seeing from Zach Brown, the team principal, all the teams of that is, is calm. And look, we will we will get this. And I firmly believe they will. Are you seeing calm from Lando? No. And this is where he needs to stop kicking himself so much. Yes, there have been some small errors. But his reaction to those, in my view, is a bit disproportionate. He needs to be, it's easy for me to say, right? I couldn't do it. Really? But, but he needs to show that mental strength and, ju and just calm, just a, just a touch. Mm. I want to see Lando be kinder to himself a little bit. It's so easier said than done because it's also what makes you a great, the ability to hold yourself to account. But I just think Lando just needs to take the intensity of the criticism on himself just down a notch because it will come. It's coming. It's all going in the right direction. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. So that was on the track. Off the track, you were very busy with Fast and Curious, weren't you? You and Greg. Um, talk to me, firstly, about what you did on the Drivers Inn and the main stage, actually, where I believe you released a cackle. <laughs> released a cackle? Released We've, a cackle. This came about through when we were in the studio and we were talking about the curses that had been lifted and we talked about Lando's curse being lifted by him winning in Miami. And you and Greg concocted between you that we think the other curse is Nico Hulkenberg not getting a podium. And that hasn't been lifted. So because that hadn't been lifted, I had to do a witch's cackle. You did, yeah. Several listeners over the course of the weekend when we were doing listener interaction very kindly reminded Greg of it. Yes, thanks, guys. My voice was somewhat straining over the course of that weekend, so it wasn't an easy thing to let out. Well, for anyone that missed it, here they are. Here's a little montage that producer Jimmy's put together. Oh, well, yeah, I'm so bloody glad. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to race day! <laughs> Ha, 
Welcome to Silverstone. Can't hear the witch. But... Oh, Yuki Snow. <laughs> Damn. This is a low point of my career, but a high point for all of us. I mean, fantastic. I'm so pleased that you actually did it because I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna not do it. You can't be boring with these things, can you? If you know, if it's demanded, you got to do it. Yeah, and I mean, it, Christian, if the fans are asking for it, the fans are asking for it. But as much as I'm taking the mic out of our fans for mentioning that, um, while we're on the subject of fans. Thank you so much to everyone who came out to see us. Thank you so much to everyone who sent us lovely messages. And Betty, so many people mentioned you. It's been the loveliest thing. Our listeners are amazing and meeting so many. And honestly, the messages, I can't thank you for them enough. They warm my heart. They're just delightful. Talk to me. I want to know what it was like having Bernie Collins on the stage, but also James Vowles. And the fact that you guys got James Vowles in a Fast and the Curious hat is unbelievable. James was fantastic, and uh, let's do James first. James was um, James was so much fun, so generous with his time, so warm, so into it. And we, thank you to we, you know, we should thank as well as Team McLaren for looking after us a lot throughout the weekend. Thank you to Team Williams as well because they, you know, obviously uh, sorted us out with Alex and Logan on the Team Talk crossover, and then James as well. So we're hugely grateful to Williams and McLaren, but. Uh, James was so much fun and and so uh, and and clearly enjoyed saying hello to the crowd as get as well and and being able to thank the crowd for coming out because my god Betty did we all suffer some weather over the weekend I got soaked everyone everyone got soaked at some point we all did we all got cold at some point so James was was genuinely I think grateful for the opportunity to come out and say thank you and say hello to everyone so James was Aww. such a star he's every bit as much of a nice man as he comes across what was the most interesting thing he said the most interesting thing he did was off stage was how fascinated and closely he was watching the Formula 3 race backstage because Formula 3 were on before us. Mm. So Alex Ferguson, the Manchester United manager, a former Manchester United manager, it was it was always said about how much he used to pay attention to the reserve team games and the youth team games and how much he sort of had a uh, and everything. I spotted a bit of Fergie-esque stuff in James, the way he was so intently watching the Formula 3 race, so intently keeping an eye on his driver who was representing them in, in there. That really interested me, the fact he was watching it as intently as an F1 race backstage. It was like, oh, you are across every detail, aren't you? Every detail of this setup. That was super impressive. Being a team principal just must be so knackering. Can you imagine? Like, it's just constant. Like, constant. Can you imagine? In answer to your question, Betty, no, I cannot. No. That's, that's too much for me. No. I mean, I'd be surprised if you suddenly took a no. career change and ended up team principal of a team. <laughs> it would be quite a jump. But, you know. It would be a step, wouldn't it? It would be a step. We'd support you. We'd support you. And then Bernie Collins is just the nicest human being I've ever met. She could be a team principal. She could be a team principal. I adore Bernie Collins. But again, again backstage... Watching qualifying with Bernie, watching a strategist's mind work, watching what she was watching for, the track positioning, where the drivers are on track, calling it two steps before oh. the commentators knew it. You know, that was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. The mind that strategists have is fascinating, isn't it? Can you imagine being in their brains for just one minute? It must just be just so clever. Yeah, Bernie was amazing. Um James was amazing. It was all amazing. Yeah. We had a lovely time. We missed you. But my goodness me, did we have a lovely time. It was it was awesome. So Silverstone sort of acted as a bit of a soft launch, didn't it, for Fast and Curious merch, which I am so excited for. And you're fully wearing it, aren't you? Oh, look, he's got a matching hat as well. Go on, what? Yeah, put that on then. Shall I put this on? Okay. Yeah, do I it. don't wear any of the caps that um, are on the display behind me. Um... They they are for display purposes only, and I've certain. Like, I'm going to the gym after this recording, so I've got this on. That's the sort of hat strategy. But I can. Are you wearing your fasting curious top to the gym? Are you? No, I will put a gym top on. I did flick this on oh. for the recording, but I'm not wearing this fasting curious hat. Isn't being worn because so it can go pristine on the display behind me that YouTube right. viewers will be able to see. But I'll pop it on for the rest of the recording. There's no harm in that, is there? They look brilliant. Well, you go and you explain what's happening with these. So Christian's modelling it. And so if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see it in all of its glory. It's bright pink. 
looks lovely really works for your complexion so all we need to do <laughs> to win it is follow our instagram account at fast curious pod caption the amazing picture of christian from the main stage so what would you caption it and tag a friend who you think would love the fast and the curious or who you think just simply needs this merch we've had some um early entries christian are you ready so well hang on hang on hang on just before we do the picture of me is you should describe for those who haven't seen it what the picture of me is. You, <laughs> you're going to be really angry if I say this. I don't mean this in a bad way. Go on, though. Go on. You'll have said worse. You'll have said worse. <laughs> I don't think you're just giving me like James Corden vibes, like not in a bad way. <laughs> well, I don't say that's a good way. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Why am I giving James Corden vibes? Producer Jimmy's <laughs> cackling like the witch from earlier in my ear. No, it's just like the the way you're holding the mic. Like it looked, you're either James Corden or you're like careful. I don't, you're doing opera or something. Do you know what I mean? Like you're screaming. But I just don't remember getting this animated. I saw this picture and I was like, I don't remember what that would have been. I just don't remember it. I love it. Don't remember it happening, but clearly it did. And if you come up with a good caption for it you could win a cap Betty you said there's been some early entries yeah let me let me read some of them so some people are saying it's a cackle being caught on camera a few people going with welcome to the stage the Dan Fallows which is really good yeah good uh, George you can win this you can win this George <laughs> like that one uh, that's a good one mm. so yeah uh, very good very good uh, two winners they'll both get a fast and curious cap each and can I just say this is largely for the purposes of my Instagram DMs you will be able to buy Fast and Curious merch. The details are coming soon. Follow us on social media. When everything's ready, it'll all be announced on there. You will be able to buy merch soon because I genuinely think I get a DM or two about this every single day of my life. It's coming. <laughs> Follow us on social media. It, we promise you it will happen. Just it, it just takes a bit of time. Okay, good. Hmm. Um, right, so other than some of those amazing stage shows that we've just talked about, and by the way, you can listen. There are so you guys did so many episodes from Silverstone. I, I imagine people haven't been able to listen to them all. So go back and relive it because there's so much great content that you and Greg did, and of course, produced Jimmy. The full Fast and Curious team, the gang. The full gang. Um, but you also spoke to Jessica Hawkins on a Ferris wheel, as you do. Um, Self-esteem ahead of her show on the main stage, which is so cool. And you did the crossover Williams podcast, didn't you, with Alex and Logan. Um, but there's still a Silverstone chat, which everyone hasn't heard. Yeah, on the Saturday afternoon, uh, Greg and our F1 Academy correspondent and friend of the podcast, Chloe Grant, headed up to the roof of the Hilton at Silverstone to McLaren's Private rooftop suite. Betty, can I get a... Ooh. Someone's doing well, aren't they, McLaren? For a chat with F1 Academy driver Bianca Bustamante. There also happened to be an F2 race going on at the same time. So that's the disclaimer. If you can hear cars, listen. Ooh. We're in a motorsport track. It happens, all right? But this is what happened uh, when the gang spoke to Bianca here on The Fast and the Curious. Team Principal Greg James here alongside F1 Academy correspondent Chloe Grant. Hello. And Fast and the Curious is on the windy rooftop of the Hilton on the start finish straight at Silverstone. Um, Chloe, you've got a blanket on? Yeah. Okay. And our guest has got a blanket on as well. Bianca Bustamante, welcome to the Fast and the Curious. Freezing. Freezing. This is not the summer British Grand Prix that we want. No, I haven't had summer. UK hasn't given me any <laughs> summer yet. No, but here we are on the on the rooftop. We can hear it's all noisy. We've got the uh, got the Red Bull thing downstairs. You might hear a bit of boo. Um, just playing to the crowd here for that. Um, you can hear that downstairs. So that's the uh, that's the noise you might be able to hear. But Bianca, welcome to the podcast. So come on then, you two have raced against each other. What do, what do you what's what's what, what, what did you what was the experience like when you were racing against Bianca and, and uh, vice versa? I mean, F1 Academy then was very different. Uh, obviously, it was behind closed doors. <laughs> uh, there wasn't, you know, we weren't racing alongside the F1 calendar. Yeah. Uh, that kind of allowed us to kind of work or be closer as as competitors, as much as it is now, because everyone's got so much media running around the F1 paddock. Um, but yeah. It, it was really it was loads of fun last year we went to a lot of racetracks that i've never been to before like 
Red Bull Ring was really nice. Uh, we went to Aragon in like the outskirts of Spain, which was also very nice. Weather's better than, than here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was loads of fun. A definite good thing is me and Bianca never crashed into each other, so we had a clean season with never, one another. We never <laughs> crashed. No, so we did a good job together on track. Um, but yeah, like Bianca says, I think it's very different this season with lots more media involvement. But last year we were all very close. I mean, especially I can remember when we did the quota testing in the, you know, the, a different F4 car and not our cars. Yeah. We were all in the same room at the same garage. We had no choice but to get along. <laughs> but it was really good fun. So yeah, it was really good. It's interesting, actually. I was, I was chatting to um, one of the McLaren guys last night about um, drivers that do have incidents or incidents on the track what you you sort of you and then and they were talking about maybe doing some uh doing some videos with the other drivers and like or getting on and like hey we're all friends really but actually there does need to be some sort of divide a bit doesn't there because you don't want to be because you are competitive you are competing against these people so there is a there's a balance to be struck with that like oh we're all getting along but actually you've got to take this this is very this is a very serious thing yeah, there is that kind of racing etiquette. You know, I would like to say the sports has etiquette. You know, there's one for tennis, one for basketball, one for soccer, and definitely one for motorsport. Because it's so hard to see your reactions out of driver because you have a helmet on. You just see cars, really. Yeah, yeah. When you're crashing to one another, you can't see the emotions. You can't see the look on their faces. So it's very hard to judge, you know, if, is that person mad at me? Is that, are we good? Are we okay? And, bef and when you take the helmet off after you cooled off, that's like kind of the only time when you know. Yeah. So it's hard to read off of that. So it's almost nearly like you have to make that, you know, you have, <laughs> you have to go out of your way to make it known that you're not mad <laughs> once you do have an incident. <laughs> but also, but it's okay to be mad. I mean, there's so much emotion flying around at top level sport that, of course, you are going to be crossed with that person if there's a mistake. And that's yeah. sort of, that should be yeah, allowed. That's really. very normal. I mean, yeah, motorsport is like, it's a roller coaster of emotions. You yeah. know, you go from FP1 to race two or race three, and it's high, it's good, it's bad, it's not. And and yeah, it is very normal to feel human and, and to go through those roller coasters of emotions. And you know, last year for me, it was like my main struggle. I, I was I was 18 last year. I was very mature um, personally. I, I didn't have a lot of growth because I was too fixated on results and right. trying to get a lap time, trying to chase the win and I forgot to grow from within and that's the main thing that McLaren has been pushing me to do you know it's very important to grow as a person as you are as a driver well let's let's dig into that a bit more and, and talk about for any listeners to this podcast who aren't aware of where you came from in your racing journey there's not many drivers from the Philippines not many big famous racing drivers from the Philippines so tell us a little bit about that journey from seeing did you were you watching a race was there a driver that you loved or was there a particular car and you were like i'm gonna do that job <laughs> was there a moment um well one of like the most notable drivers in the philippines probably marlon stockinger um he made it all the way to f3 um obviously it is a very tough sport even if you are there it's hard to stay there if anything even now it's hard to stay in mclaren it's hard to stay in f1 it's hard it's, it's hard to stay within this paddock because drivers always go, they're always, you know, in and out. You, even in Formula One, you think you have a seat mid-season, you get thrown off the bus. And unfortunately, that's the life of athletes and even more so in motorsport. Yeah. So it's very important to perform on the spot, on the spotlight. Um, so specifically in a country like Philippines where racing isn't the priority because it is very expensive, then it becomes hard to kind of influence that or to push it on kids to pursue it. Uh, you know, for me growing up, it was often very hard for me to be a driver because it nearly feels as if it was a privilege to be a driver more than as, as you know, like more than as it was a passion. And it was hard to pursue that, obviously, because we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Uh, but, but, but yeah. Tell us about when you went back to the Philippines after you'd signed for McLaren and what the reaction was like then. It's like the whole like the whole country just turned into papaya fans. <laughs> like we turned like a whole country into McLaren. And it was incredible. Like I literally go to a mall and I see McLaren caps, McLaren t-shirts, and it is nice. You know, Philippines is not a big country and to feel home and to feel, you know, that very tight bond and they kind of you know, I want to turn motorsport into a household sport in the Philippines. You know, it's not because we have basketball, we have boxing. And because we don't have a lot of racing drivers, it's hard for them to kind of find a driver. 
Wow. I believe I think this is qualifying, right? No, what is where are we now? This what, is, uh, what time are we on? F2? It's F2, no? F2. Oh, is it F2 yeah, now? Is that okay? It's a sprint race. Ah, so we've got we've got a sprint race going on behind us. Okay, well that's fine. Formation lap. Oh, it's a formation lap. Yeah, okay, I think sorry. So. Sorry. Chloe can hear everything. You can, I can't so you even can hear, hear that myself. Was a, like, yeah, you hear that I can F2 understand car. the star. Okay. <laughs> So they're doing a formation lap and then we're going to get a sprint race. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we'll try and do an interview over a formation lap and then a sprint race. Great. I can't hear myself. Great. So when you when you went back to the Philippines, was there like suddenly you noticed like a lot of sort of big billboards and posters of you and just people like being fans of yours, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, last week we just, uh, yeah, my Vogue cover shoot just came out. Nice. So. Awesome. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> I just woke up and I was on the cover of Vogue. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Obviously, it's about bridging lifestyle and everything. You know, I, as a woman, I'm very proud. And I want to, obviously, Vogue is known to be a woman's magazine. And I wanted, I want to merge that kind of gap of, of men's sport and women's and everything. Because, yeah, it, it is very beautiful. You know, motorsport is one of the sports in the world where men and women can compete equally. Yep. And the car is the equalizer. Once you have that helmet on, it doesn't really matter, does it? So yeah, it's, it's quite cool. And yeah, recently I've been on some some magazines, um, some Great. billboards. <laughs> so that's, that's quite cool. It's hard to balance all that stuff, though, isn't it? I mean, we've talked quite a lot on this podcast, Chloe, about yeah. you know you, you you have to you have to work on yourself as a as a driver, as a personality, doing yeah. all this stuff, making sure the sponsors are happy, doing all the marketing stuff. You've got so much to do before you then eventually get to sit in a car. It's kind of mad, yeah, right? Yeah, there's there's so many different factors to the sport, uh, and it can be very tough, as Bianca says. I mean, especially with money, it's just it's almost impossible uh, to make it there. I mean, that's why F1 Academy has been so brilliant for drivers like me and Bianca and all the other girls. It's just sometimes people get confused. You have to remember, F1 Academy is not a championship because women need to be separate. We don't need to be separate. F1 Academy is giving all these girls who most of the world have never ever heard of before now you can't take your eye off of them yeah. because it's given them that platform now everyone's watching them the F Formula 1 teams are watching them also gives you that financial opportunity to actually do a level you never thought you did I never thought I would race F4 I never thought I would race in America or all over Europe yeah. and F1 Academy made that dream come true for me so people need to know we don't need the championship because we are female to race separately with men we can compete with men we can beat men we're doing it I'm doing it in a mixed championship you know it's one of the main things that many people don't realize is that they think that yeah like Chloe said that the F1 Academy is there to separate men and women no it's actually F1 Academy is there to support us yeah. even financially it's an academy because me to race in F1 Academy, I don't have to pay as much. Hold that thought. Bl bloody men getting in the way of everything. <laughs> no, no, no. Am I right? Men allies. Yeah. Men allies. They're not always. allies. <laughs> They're nuisance. No. They're interrupting your flow, as you say. No, but, but it is true. Like, um, F1 Academy, all the F1 teams are there to help us support financially they are yeah. paying half of our season uh, to race all over the world and to test you know the, it's we're secured days of testing as well mm. to allow us to grow they're building connections with sponsors that want to support you know it's most importantly having a spotlight on such an important matter which is women in sports in general and, and not just that but obviously we've had so many male allies as well that believes in yes. women in sport you know to be in mclaren i'm working with women that obviously are very empowering you know they're empowering me to be an amazing driver but not just that i'm working with male engineers male mechanics mm. um males even in fashion <laughs> that are empowering me as well yeah. and i think that's so important the fact that even the professionals of, of the f1 community believes that women have potential and i think you know that speaks volume one of the really interesting things i guess is that is it really <laughs> it's now raining. <laughs> One of the really amazing things to look at is the, if you look at football, for example, I saw um, Mary Earps earlier, England lioness goalkeeping legend, and she was just saying what an amazing two or three years they've had. Things change very quickly, and we're yeah, seeing that oh things God, changing yeah. very quickly as well. And it does tend to be, it does come down to money, doesn't it? It comes yeah. down to where does the money go, and when people see that people want a thing, then they go, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep funding it. So it really is, it's quite a simple equation, really. It, it is just money because it, it follows. Let's wait for that. 
Hilton for the stay. It's um, when when uh, when you know investors and whoever is sponsors see that there's an appetite for more drivers, whoever they are, they'll go right. We'll pay. We'll pay. We'll pay. We'll pay. And and the rewards are obviously are obvious, but it happens quite quickly. So it's, if you even wind back 12 months, it's a completely different landscape. It's exactly what it? you're saying about things changing quickly. I mean, in all kind of all sports now as well, but especially motorsport. I mean, if we're looking back before F1 Academy in karting, I maybe raced one or two other girls in cars at the time I was racing um, two other girls as well. And then I was racing 14 others. And now even with the female fans as well, their support is just, it's unbelievable. It actually makes you feel emotional. I mean, I remember our last round last year in America in Kota in Austin, Texas, and we got to go along the front of the, of the stage and we got to sign some stuff um, for some girls. And there's this one girl that I'll never forget. And as soon as she saw me, she just started crying. Then I started crying because I didn't understand why she was crying. Yeah. And it was just, it, yeah, it just it really warms my heart to see the progression and the support. But it's very cool for people your age as well because it will be normal for the younger generations yeah. that yeah. there are men and women in Formula One. Yeah, that, just that will had... just be the norm at some point soon. Yeah. So what's next, Bianca? What's, uh, what's, your, what's, your, what's your focus for the next couple of years? Honestly, I just I want to pass the torch a little bit brighter to the next generation, even if it it isn't. You know, I mean, that's not for ages. What are you, 19? <laughs> yes, right. That's you it. don't need to worry about the next generation. You are that generation. Don't, don't worry about that. Yeah, but it's like it's always about. You know, I think you have to be very selfless to pursue this path. Now they're all spread apart. <laughs> Sorry, Bianca, as you were saying. No, I mean, I think you have to be very selfless. Last year, I was always focused on, I want to be the first, I want to be the first, I want to be the first. But why be the first when you can be one of many? And that's always just what I've, I've, I'm starting to think now, and I think that's a mentality McLaren's is, is keep, like, opening my eyes on. You know, every day I fall asleep, I'm like, I'm out, of, I'm drained, I'm out of inspiration, and the next morning I get a call from McLaren and be like, Bia, come on, we, we got to get to work, we, we got to push forward, we got to break boundaries every single day. And I think that's what matters, you know, like, it, I always say it takes a village to build a champion. And I think that's what I found in McLaren. That's really lovely. And I guess that's a realization of not just what the sport can do for you, but what you can do for the sport as well. And that actually opens up so many more opportunities, weirdly. Yeah, our generation, we had Susie Wolf, and now the next generation has an unbelievable amount of girls to look up to and it's it's i feel very lucky i think we both feel very lucky to be some of those girls yeah it's a very exciting time i cannot i cannot wait to see how it all pans out I for can't both of hear you. you i was just saying i can't wait to see how it pans out for both of you i'm very excited <laughs> for both of you thank, thank you Greg. So much. you're both brilliant thank you for so being are you. thank you for being you'll on be on vogue soon <laughs> Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I loved that chat. Really, I just loved hearing about her background, her passion for the sport, her passion for the sport, and also growing up in the Philippines as well. And I just, yeah, I'm really excited to follow her career. Also, I bumped into her in McLaren's hospitality in the paddock with Greg. And Greg was like, oh, this is Christian. He couldn't be bothered to come and speak to you. <laughs> it's so Greg. But I was like, thanks, Greg. But of course, people who don't get Greg's sense of humour, she sort of looked at him and was like, oh. I was like, no, 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 I didn't. I just thought like I couldn't be bothered. I was, I was working. But then Bianca laughed and was so sweet and so lovely, as you can hear from that chat. So um, another, another new friend of the podcast, Bianca, who we're going to be keeping an eye on for the rest of the season. And great to hear from Chloe. And gr always great to hear from Chloe. We love Chloe Grant. Absolutely love Chloe Grant. And while we're on the subject of McLaren, uh, I don't know how much you've heard about this, but we didn't have time to get into this over the episodes of the weekend because something incredible happened to Greg on track. I did hear about it. Jimmy, Jimmy messaged me and he was like, oh my God. <laughs> One of my favourite things ever happened. So you get these things um, called hot laps where very lucky people, very lucky people, get the chance to be taken around the circuit in a souped up supercar by a driver. And I'd been lucky enough to have one last year. Greg had never had one before. So the lovely people at McLaren like Greg will, will get you a hot lap. And of course... 
you say yes. And I was in the paddock at the time and Greg goes off and it's like, have fun. And then I sort of went around and spoke to people and, and did a few bits of work and came back quite a bit of time later. And it was like, where's Greg? <laughs> we'll let Greg explain in more detail. But heads up, if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple or whatever, this is worth either at this point flicking to YouTube or uh, watching on YouTube later or something. The footage is amazing. We're minutes away from Lights Out at the British Grand Prix. You can catch up on all of our podcasts and all of our videos from this weekend at Silverstone on the feed, on our YouTube channel, on our socials, all the rest of it. But I really, really want to tell you one of my highlights of the weekend. It was the hot lap with McLaren. It was a shaky start, but we got there in the end. So there's a little story behind this. Yesterday, we had a failed, oh, as uh, Sam Ryder is meeting Brian May down there, which is a nice moment. Sam Two Ryder legends. from the Fast and the Curious podcast, of course. Friend of the show. So um, yesterday I had a failed hot lap. These things, I was going to say these things happen, but I don't think they do. Uh, unbelievably rarely, but listen, cars break sometimes, all cars break. So I was having a hot lap yesterday and with the driver, Sam Bird. Hello, I'm Greg James, and this is me before my first hot lap. Hopefully it isn't my last. I'll try and bring him back. <laughs> having the time of my life and suddenly it went into limp home mode <laughs> which is sometimes what I feel like uh, after a breakfast show or, or I, me on a Saturday evening I'm in, a, I'm in limp home mode quite often hi uh, yeah uh, we've broken down we seem to have broken down cheers <laughs> oh no I've cursed oh my god and so I was sat on the tarmac of the world's most famous greatest arguably racing circuit for about 45 minutes as Mary Earps kept zooming past on her hot lap <laughs> and I was sitting by the old start finish straight which is the opposite side to where we are yeah. now where they used to start and stop the Grand Prix and um, we were waiting um, on the inside of one of the corners and all the stewards were flapping um. right so this is like the M25 now this is good isn't it yeah I'm actually an AA member <laughs> Should I call that? I might call that AA. We were tucked in the corner on the old start finish straight, and they were all worried because these cars was, was zooming past, and sometimes they take the inside line of that corner, the guy was saying. Yeah. And so the stewards were going, stay in the vehicle! And they were trying to get it started, and there was this bizarre moment where Sam was told to lock the car and unlock the car. Locked the car, couldn't unlock it because um, the key was stopped working and the alarm started going off. <laughs> Okay, this has never happened. We're sitting on the world's most famous racing circuit, broken down, and the alarm is now going off. <laughs> I wonder whether I'm maybe the only person who's been in a car on the Silverstone circuit where the alarm's going off <laughs> on, a, on a race weekend. Like a Sainsbury's car park. Yeah. Uh, so that was happening, and then eventually, cut sort of 35 minutes later, we were being pushed by the stewards, the race stewards. The marshals. Were, the marshals, sorry, who were absolutely amazing, by the way, and very, very funny, into, the, uh, into where race control is. The, the experience is supposed to be a hot lap, but the experience actually has been is like what happens when you don't finish and you get pushed into the pits. It's really good, isn't it? Hey Sam, thanks for calling an ambulance as well. <laughs> well, just in case. Just you know? in case. Just in case. I wanted to give you the full experience, Greg. And I've, I've had it. It was the most bougie breakdown I've ever and will A ever have. A luxurious breakdown. But then, but 24 then, hours later... Redemption. There was a slot available today and they said, would you like to go again? And I was like, of course I would. And also, I'm already spoiled. I don't need another one. They were like, no, but we'd love to show you that car anyway, because it was a bit of a shame. I was like, honestly, it was even funnier that it didn't work, to uh, be honest. Uh, even funnier. 
I had the time of my life today. Round two. Round two, right. Should we actually finally do this? <laughs> the most if you ever get if you're listening to this and you ever get a chance to do a hot lap anywhere not necessarily here but you know get if you ever get a chance or you, you've got a birthday coming up or a, if you want it as a Christmas present or whatever then I'd highly recommend just sitting with a professional driver taking you around a circuit it doesn't even have to be the fastest car in the world but it's just so interesting and such a privilege to see the level of skill required to throw a car around a circuit as quick as possible because it's like it, you know, it is safety first. If you're safe, then you can be as fast as you like. Because it was, it was like nothing else I've ever experienced. I, I wanted to shout, I've never felt more alive! <laughs> as we were sort of rolling around at 160-ish miles an hour. And doesn't it give you so much even more respect yeah. for the wonderful drivers we've devoted a podcast to? Well, 160 is is nothing for these guys. No. They're, they're going at 220, 230, aren't they? Roughly. Like 220, yeah. 220. Yeah. That's their top speed. Yeah. One one fifty is unbe unbearably fast. Oh, ridiculous! And then when the the force when you break into those corners is just I mean it's just Throws insane. You. It feels like every part of you wants to escape your body because I did it last year with Oscar. Yeah. And it was just and also I did it with Oscar Piastri who was just having the most casual chat to me while he was throwing it round at 160 miles an hour. But it's also the uh, for the last sort of 45 minutes I've been quite jittery because my adrenaline was so high. And the, your body is put through something, and I just had one lap. Imagine that for the duration of a Grand Prix, and what these what these drivers go through is is, is insane. And you're just you're just hopped up. You can't not be hopped up. So when you see things like the Lando and Oscar, uh, sorry, the Lando and Max Argy Bargy at Austria last week, you understand it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because obviously you're so amped up. But of course you're going to lose your head sometimes. Of course you're going to get into scraps and scrapes. That's the that's why it's so exciting. <laughs> that is just amazing. That is amazing. What a wild journey. One of my favourite things to happen all weekend. <laughs> also, like, what are the chances? What are the chances? Oh my god, that's like one of the world's greatest cars, and they never break down. But of course, every vehicle, no matter how wonderful they are, occasionally has a glitch. Like it's just a thing. Everything, and for it to happen to Greg is just perfect. It was just perfect. Let's round off this episode, Christian, with the George Russell Community Notice Board. Do do. Yeah, a few things to put on here, isn't there? Should we do sprint races? Yeah. Also, did you see his suit at Wimbledon that he wore? Oh, my Lord. Yeah, I, I kind of liked it. I thought he kind of... If you're going to... Listen, go bold. If you're going to go bold, go bold. And he went bold. He looked good, but it was a lot. Anyway, that's going in the centre of the community notice board because I just think it deserves it. Do you know what I mean? Um, but also going up there is the, uh, the new news around the sprint races for 2025. Yeah, so for those who have missed it, uh, the sprint races next year are going to be in China, Miami, Belgium, Austin, Brazil and Qatar. No changes to the format. I think that's good. We've, I think we've got the best sprint format we've had this year. The structure of the weekend is great. No more sprint races because there was rumours that there were going to be loads of them. I think he's good. I like the sprint races. I don't, I don't need them every weekend. I think six is the perfect number to spice things up a bit. And in terms of the tracks, no surprise to me to see them in both Miami and Austin because they're hugely popular with American fans. 
The Americans absolutely love it. Uh, it's been obvious to me when I've been out there how much people enjoy it. Mm. All good tracks. Um, I'm particularly excited for Brazil. Brazil is a real good overtaking track, often quite chaotic, often get weather. A sprint in Brazil could be absolute carnage. So that'd be something to look forward to. Liam Lawson's uh, been a bit busy, hasn't he? He did a test session at Silverstone for Red Bull. What do we know about this? Does this mean anything? Are you getting excited by this? Well, last year there was a similar test where it, it, Daniel Ricciardo jumped in a car and Red Bull looked at his lap times and went, yeah, he's, he's doing well. And that was what prompted them to make the change from, from Nick De Vries going out and Daniel coming into uh, RB, whatever it's been called this week. Um, do we know that this is a similar thing with Liam? No, because... Drivers who have got F1 potential, we've seen it with Jack Doohan earlier in the season, do have tests. So there is no guarantee that this is the same thing. But all the paddock rumours are that Sergio is under real pressure. Mm. So I think that test, if anything, is do we think Liam's good enough to go to RB alongside Yuki and stick Daniel in for the rest of the season? I've been saying on the podcast for a few episodes now, I think we've got a constructor's title battle on. So it's far from definite. It is not a done deal that you, that, that that Sergio is leaving that seat. But I think he is under real, real, real pressure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm as convinced as I can be on that. I think this is the most pressure we've seen. On, we've been going off for 18 months about, will Sergio cling on to that seat? This is the most that chat has been hyped up. Mm, yeah, it's a shame. I feel sorry for him. Oh, it's such a shame, but it's it's not working at the minute. It, it's it's just not working. He's he's you know, it's nowhere near good enough at the moment. Just in terms of sheer pace, more than anything. And bless Checo, but something's not clicking there. Next up, we've got the Hungarian Grand Prix, and mm. we're building up some nice momentum at the moment, aren't we? And there's been some incredible. Grand Prix, and I, I mean, Hungarian Grand Prix is going to be very good, isn't it? Let's be honest. I think it will be. It's a. It, we, also, we've got a different characteristic of track from Silverstone. The Hungary's much tighter, much more difficult to overtake, some much more fiddly sections, and that's why I'm going to be really interesting as to see who is quick and who isn't. You know, I said right at the start of the podcast, I need to see a couple more races from Mercedes to be proven that they are properly back. Mm. I'm I'm interested in that. I think it'll be really interesting to see with Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari and McLaren, where that pecking order goes on a different type of track will be fascinating. So we're going to be back after that race to break down all the action, of course. We're always there. But before we go, time to remind you about our pals at NordVPN. Are you still using it out in Australia? Yes, I am. Obviously, I love it. It's, it's, I said this last time. It is saving my life. It's a game changer for numerous reasons. But, oh, if I didn't have NordVPN, I don't know what I'd do. And I recommended it to someone the other day. I've recommended it to a couple of people who have taken it because it genuinely, you stick it on all your devices. You can catch up on all the telly you watch. You can get yourself cheaper flights by changing your virtual location. Hotel fees, everything. Yeah. If you're planning on heading to Hungary for the next Grand Prix, use it while you're planning that trip. Or even future Grand Prix if you've left it a bit late for Hungary because some flights and hotel fees, I didn't know this until we started talking about NordVPN, they change depending on where you book from. So if you change your virtual location to America while booking an American hotel, you might get it cheaper, for example. Uh, so change your location when you're sorting all your logistics could help you spend less, not just for going to Grand Prix, for your, for your summer holiday as well. When you're planning a trip. It just makes your life better, doesn't it? It's a no-brainer. So to get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash TFATC. Our link will also give you an extra four months on the two-year plan as well. And there's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the description of this episode. It's just there's no risk. No risk at all. No risk at all. 30 days as well. It's a very generous length of time, I think. Anyway, Christian, this has been a pleasure. Uh, mate, it has been a lovely pleasure catching up. It really, really has. And we are, you're, you're, you're doing amazing work in Australia doing the football, but you're coming home soon, aren't you? And I'm so excited to see you. I know. Buzzing. Buzzing. I'm going to get, I get to give you a hug. Oh, God. Lovely. Hang on. Right. I've been really nice to you saying <laughs> I'm really missing you and I'm excited to give you a hug. And you it'd be nice to me. To be, yeah. I've been quite mean to you, I think, this episode. So, yeah. I'm excited to see you. I'm genuinely missing my friend, and all I get thrown back in response is is stick. I tell you what, <laughs> this Betty doesn't bully me as such. This is the cardboard cutout of Betty that I'm now I picked up. So 
but a, a nicer Betty, a better Betty, if you will. Yeah, she's got she's she's got herself together that one, hasn't she? Oh my God, if you're watching on YouTube, it's double Betty. Look. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for listening to the Fast and Curious. We'll be back soon. Bye, cardboard Betty. Goodbye, Christian. Bye bye now. <laughs> I feel like someone needs to take it off you. It's really uncomfortable. <laughs> Bye-bye now.